All right, hello guys, welcome back uh, to another video. Today we're gonna to be talking about the next chapter of IG Business Management. This is a high level specific one, so if you're in standard level, come back for the next video, we'll be moving on to chapter two. However, this is an important chapter for high level people. It has a lot of tools, a lot of important information. That's also why we're back here with the whiteboard because I think a visual representation of a lot of these tools is really key uh, when it comes to understanding these tools. But anyway, so this chapter is 1.7, organizational planning tools. And so the first kind of key points that we deal with in this chapter are the types of decisions and types of decision making. All right, so what are the types of decisions? There's three of them. You have operational, so that's talking your day-to-day -day decisions. That's your decisions on, you know, when you're within the business. Say, so, you know, you're in a McDonald's, it's your decisions on, you know, operating things within, you know, what decisions are we going to make so that this can be more efficient, second, like whatever. Like just on a very small scale. That was a bad example, but like a very small, like, you know, I don't know, where are we going to put these containers of food today, right? Where were you, you know, where's the shipment going to enter in? Things like that. The second is tactical. These are regular or short terms. So these are kind of smaller changes you'll be making on the level of the business. Um, however, they go beyond daily. They're not just, hey, we're going to put this box of food here today or we're going to, you know, whatever. This might be, hey, we're going to change... Our, our plan with our shipper, right? You know, our supplier. Now, instead of, you know, bringing us 5,000 hamburgers, they're going to give us 6,000 hamburgers. All right, so it's making some short term plans. Then you have strategies. Now, strategies are long term. So that's talking, you know, that's when we're getting back into our vision and mission statement, which we've discussed in the previous chapters. But here you're talking about what are the real big goals that we want our business to have and get to, and how can we achieve those goals? So this might also be, if we're talking McDonald's, or now we're talking the example for the, the scale of the whole business and what are their plans. Or on the example, uh, on the scale of, you know, franchise for McDonald's, you know, one McDonald's store. Well, where do they want to be? You know, how many, maybe goals, how many customers they want to get to, new products they want to take out, you know, whatever. And how are they going to get to those goals? Now, there are three types of major decision-making methods or uh, types of decision-making as well. And there's importance. All right, so the first one is intuitive. Uh, intuitive is really just use your gut. You're just thinking about this, you mull it over, and you say, all right, I think this sounds like the most logical decision, and you make it. Now, obviously, this can be good because it's very quick, it's very efficient, because just your manager is like, you know what, this seems like the best decision, we're going to go with it. However, it can also be unreliable because it's a gut decision. You're not really taking any facts into account. It's more just your feeling of this seems like the right thing to do in this context. Sometimes it's the right way to go because sometimes the numbers lie, but it depends. Second is scientific. Scientific means we weigh all of the information, we do a data collection analysis, and then we come to a more formal decision. Um, this is much more, basically this is, we're talking gut, this is pure logic. The third one then is to use a decision making framework. Now, what does this mean? A decision making framework means basically your company is going to have a method that is going to develop and each time it has to make a decision, it follows a series of steps. Okay, so it's not just, we're gonna look at the data, what does the data say? I'm gonna listen to my gut, what does my gut say? Instead, it's we gotta follow this specific process. An example of this process would be, you start with a problem, all right, identify what the problem is. What are the causes of this problem? Then, you start gathering data. Then you start analyzing that data. You assess all the different, the costs and the benefits, you pull different stakeholders in the business, then you select the most suitable option, communicate it to your, to your stakeholders, and evaluate the outcome. That would be an example of a process. That's obviously a very simple one, but also I'd say a pretty common one in different kinds of businesses to follow that kind of you know process. That's like a step-by-step, -step, you're doing these things. Anyway, so these are the types of decision-making uh, processes that you can use. And again, just remember, these can apply to uh, operational, so daily decisions, tactical, you know, regular short-term decisions and strategies, which are long-term. You can use any of these for any of those types of decisions. All right. I love whiteboards, by the way. I'm like, I should become a teacher or something. This is great. Um, all right, so moving on to the first type of tool. So there are four tools 
does a section outline. And really, this is all the section is, is just it explains that basic part I just went over, and then it talks about the tools. So what are the tools? The first one is the fish bone diagram. This is a type of cause and effect diagram, all right? So what you're gonna do, you're gonna kind of set up a table here. All right, so over here you're gonna put cause, and over here you're gonna put effect. Now, the effect is the problem, all right? So we're just gonna put problem here. I'm gonna put a nice little circle around it. All right, so the effect is the problem. Why is it the effect? Well, because in this part, we're talking about the causes that create this effect, or this problem. It's a pretty straightforward one. Now, why do we call this a fish bone diagram? Well, because of its structure. All right, so we have a line that runs through this. And actually, I think a key, a key point to outline, the, um, the references I was using to kind of really get all the information on these diagrams and to make one that's useful, uh, used this kind of structure. This, this top part, this is cause effect to this line, aren't always there. Sometimes, and actually, I'll, I'll just go ahead and take these out. Where's the eraser? I'll go ahead and just take these out. In a lot of cases, it'll just go straight line to your problem, all right? So you've got a line going straight through, getting to your problem. And again, why do they have this type of structure for the fishbone diagram? Well, that is because it looks like a fishbone would drawn out entirely. So then what you do is you have on the right, again, you have your problem, on the left, remember this is the cause part, right? Now you're trying to identify what are the causes of this problem. Now you can do this in a few ways. There are some established ways of doing it. Um, one of those ways is known as the six M's. It's basically a set of different, you know, categories um, that that kind of you can fit the cause of a problem into. Let me actually check in my notes what those are. Um, Again, remember this is not anything determined in stone. You can really pick whatever kind of uh, whatever kind of factors you want. You can use those six M's, which are machine, mother nature, manpower, money, market, and materials. Um, again, those all just follow pretty simple common sense the definitions. Or you can use one of the four P's, which are people, policies, paraphernalia, and procedure. These are very general categories, right? You can pick whatever general categories you want, but the idea here is you're picking some kind of general categories to work with. And those general categories, you draw out like this. I'm just gonna do four to make this simple, all right? So let's say you have, you've picked four major categories. You know what we're gonna do? Uh, we're actually gonna use the, we'll use, you know, people, and these products, I don't know, let's say uh, location, and you know, we'll use marketing. And let's say that the problem, we'll say it's a, a we'll pick a common one, a lack of sales, all right? We're just using an example here. So it's just a bit clearer for you guys. All right, now I'm not gonna draw this whole fishbone diagram, but, uh, you know, fill in everything here for this example, but, you know, we'll use a sample. Um, so let's say we have a lack of sales. All right. So we know we have these general categories. So these are general things that, okay, something's going wrong with the people that's leading to a lack of sales. Something is wrong with our product leads to a lack of sales. Something is wrong with our location leads to a lack of sales. And something is wrong with our marketing leading to a lack of sales. Everything here is explaining why this is happening. Then what you do is you go into each of these general categories and you start specifying, so you start drawing these smaller branches off of it. This is when it really starts to look like a fish bone. And each of these branches, even some of these could have a sub branch that comes off of the branch. So you could get to your third level. And now on each of these sub branches, you're now specifying what is wrong with the product, the people, the marketing, the location. So right now with these big, these big sticks, we have the overall problems. The main categories are primary causes, and then here we get to the secondary causes, the, the supporting problems of why. So you get an example. Let's say you're not selling enough. Uh, let's use product. All right, what's wrong with the product? 
Um, maybe it's the, the quality. So it's, uh, it's poor quality. Okay, fantastic. Um, and maybe you could even go a little deeper though. Why is it poor quality? Um, we'll say, you know, uh, not enough capital. You know, you're not investing enough in having a good quality product. So therefore it's coming out poor quality. You know, your factory equipment's bad or whatever. And you can keep taking branches and branches and branches off of this to create um, a really complete diagram. And this we're going to do with every single aspect of this. Again, four factors. This could be six factors. This could be eight factors. But really what this is, is it is a tool for businesses so that they can figure out what is the problem, what is causing the problem, and then from there use this to solve the problem. This is a tool for businesses so that they can solve the problems. This will be a very common one in, for instance, uh, an internal assessment. Because if you remember, in the business management internal assessment, what are you doing? You're identifying what's something the business is doing, what's a move they're making or a problem they're facing or whatever. You can use this in a lot of cases to be, well, what decision should they make? What problem are they facing? What are the causes? And then, what do you do? Well, you examine this and you say, what are these causes? And then you figure out how can we solve them. Um, so it's a very useful tool, but also it is a bit subjective because you do have to you know, know what your problems are. You have to kind of determine the overall things. You could obviously miss details, things like that. But overall, quite a useful tool. All right, so this is the fishbone diagram. This is one that's often mentioned in business management, so it's an important one to understand if you're high level. Moving on to the second one, let's to erase. The second one is a decision tree. So the first one, this one is qualitative, as they call it, because it's focusing on the qualities, on the adjective descriptions. Those are the two kind of important distinctions of well all in business management. Is that type is qualitative? This next one is quantitative. Quantitative means you're dealing with numbers in math. So you know, qualitative is adjective descriptions. Quantitative is math. So this next one is the decision tree. So what is a decision tree? This is basically, you can almost imagine these like roads, right? You're, you're at a crossroads in a certain decision. Let's say, um, I'm gonna use a basic example here. So let's say you wanna open up a new location for a business, okay? You, I, I keep going back to the McDonald's example, but it's perfect. So, you, all right, you gotta, you gotta make these, and what you wanna do is you wanna decide, where am I gonna open my store? And you have two options in front. Okay, so your options are we could uh, we could open a we could open a store in New York City, or we could open one in Los Angeles. And so then, what this this decision tree allows you to do is allows you to kind of make projections and decide which of these decisions is better than the other. Um, so first, you have here you have the decision that you're facing. Then one of the most important things you got to take into account is how much is this decision going to cost? Because this is really, this is an economic analysis, all right? More than anything, you're analyzing the economics of which of these decisions are better. So uh, let's say to open a store in NYC, it's going to cost you $50,000. And open a store in LA, it's going to cost you $10,000, all right? So right off the bat, this is a much cheaper investment than this. It costs, you know, two thirds of what this costs. All right, but then what we're gonna do is we're gonna face the probabilities of what would happen with each of these moves. Let's say uh, option one is that everything goes great. Everything's fantastic. And this, this store produces $20,000, no, not 20,000. I'm gonna say it produces 200,000. All right, another one is it goes mediocre and it produces 100,000. And the other option is goes bad and it produces nothing. In fact, you say. All right, and then, the, and then this one, we're gonna say if it goes good, mediocre, or bad. If it goes good, we're gonna say it's gonna produce you uh, 100,000. If it goes medium, it's gonna produce you 75,000. And if it goes bad, it's gonna produce you 25,000. Okay, 
So here we have the different numbers. Again, I'm going really into specifics with this example, but I think it, it's really important for you to see these specifics to be able to kind of understand what are we using a decision tree for. Okay, so then what we're gonna do is we have to assign probabilities to what are, what's the chance of each of these outcomes. So let's say the chance it goes really well in New York is uh, 5%, chance it goes mediocre is uh, 50%, chance it goes bad is 25%. All right, and then now the chance it goes good is 10%, the chance it goes mediocre is 60%, and the chance it goes bad is 30%. Okay, so what are we looking at here? Well, um, in this case, you're, you have to examine what the different options I feel like I've made this one a bit too obvious, because in most cases it, it tends to be more balanced. But what you see here, this is a pretty high risk bet because you invest a little bit more, and there's a very small chance you can make a lot of money. And even if there's a 50% chance you can make 100,000. So 55% of the time, the majority of the time, you're gonna make a very good sum of money off of opening a store in New York. Versus under this circumstance, there's a 10% chance that you're gonna make the same amount that you can make in New York. So, I mean, just look at the probabilities here. Obviously, New York looks like a better one, because actually, I, at first glance, I thought LA's better, but you see your 50% chance, you're gonna make the same you could make only 10% of the time. Although there's, there's a 70% chance you're making at least 75 bucks, and a 100% chance you're coming home with at least $25,000. So you're at least gonna recoup your own costs. Here there's a 45% chance you don't even recoup your own costs. But in the majority of cases, you are gonna come out winning. So then what can we do with this? Well, we have to make a calculation of the economic value of each of these decisions and each of these outcomes. Um, so the way you do this is so there's a formula. All right, so this is, this is the tree. This is it, all right? Decision that you're, that's facing you right now, what are the decisions, often they're not just two, there could be three, there could be even more. But what are the decisions, how much is that decision gonna cost, and then what are they like the outcomes, what's the probabilities, what are the economic values? So then, what do we do with this with this uh, this decision tree? Well, we're gonna go ahead, let's say we want to look at how is this, what is the economic value of this outcome, of you know, of the, the New York option? Um, uh, what is the what is the outcome of the New York option? What you're gonna do here is what else? Yes. You look at what's the outcome of the New York option. Sorry, one of the teachers came in. Um, you're gonna look at what's the outcome of the New York option. All right. So what the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna grab the economic values that we have here. So you can make two hundred thousand, you can make one hundred thousand, or you can make zero. Then how much are you gonna spend? What's the probability? And you have two. Add this together. I'm sorry, it sounds a lot more complicated than it really is. Um, so what we're gonna do, all right, so 200,000. Okay, fantastic. So this can make $200,000, 5% chance. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take 200K and we're gonna multiply that by 0 0.05. And that's gonna give us a result. Then we're gonna do the same with 100,000. We're going to multiply it by 0.5 because that's representing the 50%. All right, and then the last one, we're going to multiply $0, 0 0.00 by 0 0.45. And so that's going to give us each of our outcomes here. And actually, I think this I can calculate pretty directly. Uh, we have, let's say, 5% of 250, or 200, sorry. That's going to be uh, $10,000. Right, hundred thousand. That's going to be that's going to be fifty percent of that. So that's going to be fifty thousand, and this is going to be zero. Okay. So uh, value here is sixty thousand. All right. And then finally, we got to subtract. What are we going to spend on this? So this is fifteen thousand. That's going to give us forty-five thousand. So in summary, the full economic value of this move is. $45,000, all right, you see this here? So this is all quite simple, I mean, it's a lot of numbers, that's the thing, if this appears in the exam, it's easy if you know how to do it, but it is really a lot of work to just math all of this out. Um, because as you see here, you know, you have each of the moves you could be making, you have each of the outcomes, and so what you do to determine the economic value of each decision, you have to take how much money is this going to produce on average because you're taking the percentage that happens by how much money you get if it does happen. Because obviously it's great if this 200,000 one happens, that's what we want to happen. 
but only it's only gonna happen five percent of the time. So it doesn't have an economic value of two hundred thousand. We can't assign it the same value as you know the one that's one hundred thousand fifty percent of the time. Obviously, you know in most cases this this one's not gonna happen. So we're trying to balance that out. So we use the percentage by the value to get what's really the value here, and then we have to subtract how much we're spending. That's an, that's important. I mean the difference here is pretty small what we see. But let's say this one costs fifty thousand to do, and this one only costs five thousand. Well, that's a very important thing to take into account. Is you know the price differences in each of these plans. And uh, sorry, I'm realizing you can't see everything all the way down here. Um, but anyway, so and then what you're going to do? I'm not going to do it here because it's going to take a really long time. But you do the same exact thing for this part of the bottom. If you guys want to do it, you can. Because I don't even know which one of these is actually better at having. I thought it was going to be this one, but like. It comes up pretty well, actually. Um, because I will, I'll warn you guys, I did pretty much come up with this one on the spot. Um, but it's just an effective example to show you guys. So you can map this out as well. And then what you want to do is you want to see how much does this decision come to come out to economically. Let's just say in a hypothetical case, this comes out to be worth fifty thousand dollars. All right. So this, this one's worth fifty thousand. This one's worth forty-five thousand. What does that mean? This is a better decision than this economically. Economically, that's the important one, though, is that. So what is the problem with this decision tree? Is that it's very limited as a tool because the only thing it tells you is the economic value of these decisions. It doesn't tell you anything about the scale, about the time it's going to take, about the capital you need to employ. All it does is the money, but anything else, it does not tell you. So this is a very limited tool. It has to be used alongside other tools in most circumstances. I can't make a decision on where I'm gonna open a store solely by this. Because if I do it based on this, I could be leaving out a lot of really important factors that could be more important in the long run. The other consequence of this is it's very subjective and it could be a bit faulty because the problem is these are projections. We don't actually know what is the probability of these. We're just kind of estimating based on what we know on markets. And of course, we're basing it off of our best information. But let's say all of a sudden there's a recession in, in New York City. Well, all of a sudden, there's not a 45% chance we're going to make zero dollars. There's an 80% chance. All right, well, this changes very dramatically. But of course, we don't know that when we're making the projection. We only know that in the future when we make the decision. So that's one problem with this is that also it's limited to what we know as a company because all this information, if you're wondering where it comes from, it comes from the company's own projections. So that's a really important thing as well. All right, we've gone halfway through the tools. We now have the other half. And then we're done with chapter one of business. So congratulations for those of you guys who have gotten here. Only four left, which the, the other four were difficult and longer, but don't worry about it. We're getting there. Um, so moving on. The next tool we have to deal with is the forest field analysis. This is a, a simpler, less mathy one. This is also qualitative. The way this works, all right, so we're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw a score in the middle. And we're going to put in there a plan that we want to implement, all right? Because the goal of this is to evaluate, it. this is like a decision tree. The idea is to support or to, to examine the supporting and opposing forces of a plan that a business has, all right? So then what you're going to do is, yeah, this is the middle on the right. You're going to draw arrows and in these arrows, you're going to put the supporting forces of this plan. All right, so anything that would incentivize you to make this plan work. Then on the left, I'll put the supporting up here. On the left, as you guys might imagine, we're going to put the opposites, which are the opposing forces. Sorry, I'm going to go close the window because there is some construction going on outside. Okay, so here we have the opposing forces, as you might imagine. So these are the forces that go against your plan. So let's say you want to open a new store in New York City. Supporting forces might be there's a large market of people to buy uh, to buy your products. You know, there's there's a good amount of investors, things like that. Opposing plans might be the rent's really expensive. Uh, the shipment from your base to where New York is could be really expensive, things like that. So you're going to put these online. All right, and then so in each of these you're gonna write, you know, it's normally it's a bubble error on one of these. And so inside the error, you write each each problem, each factor. And then what you're gonna do 
is you're going to look at uh, you know each of these factors and you're going to rank each of them based on their importance to you. All right, they're important to think of the impact they're going to have on the planet. So you know you rank them from one to five. So let's say if you think this one's if this one's not important at all, you put it at one. Or you think it's really not that important. It's a five. You know, that means it's really, really important. And if it's somewhere in the middle, you can put like a four or a three. And the same over here. You know, you do a two, you do a three, and you know, like a one. All right? And then what you're going to do is based on the, each of these factors and their importance, you're going to come out with numbers, and you can more or less compare those numbers. I mean, in this case, you see this supporting forces add up to 10. These forces, the opposing add up to six. In this case, this would seem clear. There's a lot better than you know the same amount of forces, but these ones are stronger. And of course, you can't weigh every force equally. So that's the idea: is that you give these scores to each force so that you can kind of evaluate which are more important, which are less important. So this one tells you, you know, there's there's the same amount of forces, but these are stronger uh, supporting forces than the opposing forces. So in that case, we should proceed with this plan. Um, but this is this is just a way for you to evaluate if a plan is a good idea or a bad idea. Um, the problem with this, of course, is that it is subjective. Uh, these grades, you put them yourself. So, of course, if you're already in favor of a plan or against the plan, you're going to start putting them, the grades in a certain way. It does have to be supplemented by other tools because it's qualitative, not quantitative. And qualitative, I mean, every tool should be supplemented by other ones. It's hard to just use one tool and get a really complete look at uh, any decision you want to make. Um, but so here, again, it's, it's subjective. You can have disputes because also some people could look at this and be like, well, it's 10 to 6, so we should, come, we should go along with this plan. And others that could be, well, 10 to 6 is not enough of a margin. If it's only a bit better than it is not, like only a bit more good than not good, well, then that doesn't seem very convincing to me, you know? So there's also disputes of it's up to your interpretation as well of this and, you know, how you're scoring it and all those things. So it's, it's hard to make a completely, you know, confident decision based on this, but it is a useful tool to begin evaluating because pretty much it's just the pro-con list of this decision with a bit more, uh, a few more steps on that. Anyway, so that is the force field analysis. That brings us to the final tool of this chapter of business management, and that is the Gantt chart. The Gantt chart, this one's a pretty straightforward one. Uh, so what do you do with the Gantt chart? This is if you have anything, so you've already made your decision, or you're, you're maybe close to making it, and you're trying to figure out either, this is a decision we've made, how long is this going to take, or we're thinking of this decision, what are the steps to do it? You typically see a Gantt chart as a grid, all right? A grid, like this, with rows and columns. Okay, this is, this is a very basic four by four. Um, five by four, I can't count. Um, I'll say I'm teaching, I, I'm giving me explanation to business, not math. Math is far from my specialty. Um, anyway, but so what you do here, so, at the top, this top part are going to be dates. All right, so you're trying because really what you're trying to do is evaluate with this plan what are the steps in this process and how long are each of these steps going to take. One thing to actually ask for you in the internal assessment is to do this for your internal assessment to basically say, What are the steps of my internal assessment and how long are these steps going to take? And actually, I will use that as an example. So let's say you're going to do research here. Um, let's say you're going to interview somebody, you're going to write, and you're going to edit. And then, of course, I'm super overgeneralizing. So, um, let's say we got, we're going to do about, you know, months, September, October, October, uh, November, December, and January. Okay? So, months, steps, and you're in your process. Um, so what are you going to be doing with these? Well, basically, so you have these little boxes and you shape in the box when you're going to be doing this step. All right. And so the idea is you look at how long will each step take and what steps can you do concurrently? All right. What steps can you do concurrently? So obviously, and you're going to start, you start with the steps that are going to, that, are, that have to come first. Um, so let's say you're going to do your research and to start this project before I can even interview somebody, I got to research my topic. I got to at least know my topic. Right? 
this research is going to take a while. So let's say it's we're doing September and October, I'm going to keep doing some research. But now I know enough that I can have a good interview. Okay. So I have my interview. All right, but let's say this interview raises some new questions. We still need more information. So in November, we're going to keep researching. Okay. And then in December, finally, we finish research. And so we're going to write. And now, once we finish writing in January, we're going to meet with our supervisor. We're going to edit it. And boom, end of January, we have, an, we have a finished internal assessment. They, they, they do ask you to do this in your proposal for at least for a high level uh, internal assessment and business management. I don't know if in standard level they do or not. I believe they do. Um, it also depends on the year because they sometimes change requirements. But they often you know, ask for this also. So it, it is a useful tool for even you to organize yourself because this is not very complicated. I mean, as you, as you can see right here, all you're doing is you're putting the time. So what, you know, typically you're doing small intervals. You might do intervals about week, two weeks, because you can really get specific. It's not common to see them by months. Um, and again, you see here, you have the steps that the research has to come first. We have to start with the research. The research is going to take a month and I can't do anything else until I've done this research. And then this step, all right, so I can now do my interview and I need to keep my research going. I need to keep my research going, but now I know enough I can do my interview, right? Now I finish my interview, I need to keep doing research. And the thing is, I can't write until I've finished this research. So another research total is going to take three months along with the interview. And three of the interview I could do here, but I'm going to do it here because I want it as early as possible. Because really, this is trying to see how can we optimize everything, how can we try to combine as many things as possible. Um, Anyway, so let me see here in this step, we have writing. So writing, again, we have to have a research finished before we can do the writing. I can't put writing here. So that's why we have this, is to see what like, we can't do this concurrently. But now that we have the writing done, and we can't edit until we have a, until we've written it. Obviously, you can't edit nothing. you got to edit the draft. So the editing has to come later, and it has to be the last step. And once you finish, you have this. So again, this is, just, this is just a prediction tool showing time scale, what can you do together at the same time. It's just a graphic representation of all of that information. Anyway, so that really, uh, that covers pretty much everything that there is in this chapter. There's there's not much, uh, you know, extra information. Of course, the limitation of this is that all it covers is time. It doesn't cover cost. It doesn't cover the scope of the project. It's a bit of a limited, a limited tool in that sense. But, I mean, that's what you see with all these tools is they're really good at, like, one thing. Um, you know, certain, some of them are very good in the, in the qualitative sense, some of them are very holistic and very complete, but they're not very specific. And, and ones like these are very good at very specific things. You know, they're very, they're very quantitative, but you don't get a, a big picture view. So each of these has their own benefits, has their own drawbacks. Um, but they're important all to understand them so that you can understand business management. And when it comes to applying tools to different decisions being made in the exams and in your internal assessments, well, you're going to understand all these. Um, anyway, so that is, that is really it. Thank you guys all for sticking with me. I do appreciate all of you. And as I erase this, I'm just going to say thank you for watching. I appreciate your viewership and I will be continuing to take out videos. Uh, probably I'll be getting another one out, uh, today talking about the next chapters in business management. Uh, if you guys want any more information on the, on business management, the playlist with all the videos that I've made down in the description. You guys can go ahead and check this out, subscribe for more content, and thank you all for watching. Have a fantastic rest of your day.